a war that spans the breadth of the Near East, from the Mediterranean to the border of India. A mad king, hellbent on revenge. A poor and isolated people living in terror of his army. All changed and turned upside down by the actions of one fearless and devout woman. The Book of Judith has held people spellbound for millennia, but why is it not included in most religious texts? The Book of Judith occupies an unusual place among the religious texts of the three major Abrahamic religions. Unlike other religious stories, such as the Book of Job, which has been consistently present in the Jewish Tanakh, the Christian Old Testament, and the Muslim Quran, Judith's place within the sacred books has been the subject of much controversy and debate. It is perhaps the only biblical story to seemingly disappear for a millennium within a religion's folklore, only to make a late medieval comeback and inspire facets of one of its largest holidays. Its genre is also debatable. Is Judith an allegory, a historical account, or even a precursor to the historical novel? The character and personality of Judith herself is something of a rarity, even an anomaly within religious narratives. She is an action hero who would not be out of place in a modern thriller starring Gal Gadot or Charlize Theron. She acts decisively and without hesitation, showing no mercy to her enemies or patience with those on her own side who would remain passive in the face of subjugation by a foreign enemy. It is probably because of this strength and opposition to overwhelming force that the popularity of Judith has risen at times of national or existential danger over the centuries. But what exactly is it about the story that has made it simultaneously popular as well as denounced? And what is its connection with eating an awful lot of cheese? The answer to these questions and more will come today on Intrigue Mind. But before we journey to the ancient Near East, if you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Your support will greatly help us keep the channel producing more intriguing content. The story of Judith begins in the 12th year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, who in the books is described as King of the Assyrians, who ruled from his capital at Nineveh in modern-day northern Iraq, sometime around the 6th century BC. Arfashad was the ruler of the Medes, an Iranian people who built a great empire and were among the legendary ancestors of the modern-day Kurdish people. For reasons not given in the story, Nebuchadnezzar and Arfashad went to war, as kings in those days did. Nebuchadnezzar called on the cities and smaller kingdoms from the eastern Mediterranean to India to join him. But nearly all of those west of the Euphrates declined, as they did not fear him. Enraged, Nebuchadnezzar vowed revenge over the recalcitrant peoples. In the end, Nebuchadnezzar was victorious over Arfashad, and unfortunately for the cities of the west, Nebuchadnezzar remembered their disrespect, and six years after the war with Arfashad began, he dispatched his second-in-command, Holofernes, to destroy the lands along the Mediterranean coast. Holofernes followed Nebuchadnezzar's order, and with his 130,000 strong army, he marched north and west, first along the Euphrates and then into Cilicia, and from there south into Syria and through the great cities of Damascus, Sidon, and Tyre. In every place he went, Holofernes burned and killed, carrying captives off into slavery, looting countless valuables and capturing livestock in the name of his king. Even when cities began to surrender to him on sight, he still cut down their sacred groves and temples telling them that the only god they were to serve was his king, Nebuchadnezzar. Eventually, Holofernes passed through Lebanon and reached the border of the lands of Judea. The Israelites were alarmed at the appearance of the vast army and were anxious about the fate of their temple, which had recently been rebuilt following their captivity in Babylon. They resolved to resist and prayed and fasted while Holofernes moved his army into their land. An Ammonite from the land of Jordan told Holofernes of the Israelites' history and that when they were devout to their god, they were invincible but only suffered defeat when they departed from his law. Undeterred, Holofernes put the Israelite village of Bethulia under siege. Cutting off the water supply, Holofernes expected his victory to be quick and to resume his march south in short order, but the Jews of Bethulia resisted him. They held out for more than a month, but after that time, the water stores had run out and the people of the town confronted their leaders. The chief among them, Uzziah, asked for five more days, after which he said if they were not delivered by God or their fellow Israelites with rain or victory, they would surrender the town. Hearing this announcement, a widow by the name of Judith, who lived in Bethulia and was known to be beautiful, highly devout, as well as wealthy from her husband's inheritance, summoned two of the chief men to her house and admonished them for testing God and for thinking of surrender. If Bethulia were to fall, she told them, then the whole of the kingdom of Judea would follow and the Israelites would once more be slaves to their conquerors. The men agreed and asked her to pray for rain so that they could continue the fight, but Judith again upbraided them. Listen to me, she said. I intend to do something, the memory of which will be handed down to the children of our race from age to age. The Lord will make use of me to rescue Israel. With that, the men left her home, and Judith spent a long time praying before bathing and dressing in her finest robes and jewelry. 
making herself beautiful enough to beguile the eye of any man who saw her. After that, she filled skins with oil and wine, and packed a sack with cakes and other delicious foods. Judith and her maidservant passed into the lines of Holofernes' men, and Judith informed them that she had some very valuable intelligence which she would share only with their leader. Holofernes immediately invited her into his company. Judith laid herself face first on the ground and did homage to him, extolling him and his greatness as well as his king, Nebuchadnezzar. She told him that the Israelites in the town intended to use food and drink set aside as offerings to the temple in Jerusalem to sustain themselves during the siege, and once she had heard the sacrilege, she endeavored to find Holofernes, telling him, We have heard of your genius and adroitness of mind. She offered to pray every night until God told her that the people of Bethulia had committed the sin of eating the sacred food, after which they would lose divine protection and it would be safe for Holofernes to take the town. This done, she offered to be his guide all the way to Jerusalem. Impressed, Holofernes said, There is no woman like her from one end of the earth to the other, so lovely of face and so wise of speech. So for three days, Judith remained as Holofernes' guest, going out into the woods each night to bathe and pray and sharing his meals. On the third night, Holofernes sent his eunuch servant to bring her to a private dinner with him and his senior officers, saying, We shall be disgraced if we let a woman like this go without seducing her. If we do not seduce her, everyone will laugh at us. Who am I, Judith replied on receiving the invitation, to resist my lord. Judith again put on her finest clothes and jewelry, and when she arrived at Holofernes' tent, he was so overcome with her appearance that he drank far more than he ever had in his life. Judith encouraged him by feeding him salty cheese. When it grew late, Holofernes' men left their enraptured commander alone with her, but Holofernes was so drunk that he simply fell into his bed and passed out. Seizing her moment, Judith took down his sword and prayed for strength, after which she struck him twice in the neck and cut off his head. Next, she called for her servant to come with her bag, and they placed the head inside before going out into the woods to pray as they had done every night since their arrival. Seeing and hearing nothing amiss, Holofernes' sentries allowed her to pass through their lines, and Judith and her maid made their way quickly back to Bethulia, where they told all of the people what they had done. Judith gave thanks to God for delivering her and giving her the power to smite her enemy, and then she instructed the Bethulians to attack the Assyrian army in the morning and hang Holofernes' head from their walls. This caused the Assyrian army to fall into confusion, and they ran away from Bethulia in complete disarray. The Israelites fell on their fleeing enemies, killing many before plundering the Assyrian camp, rich with the bounty of its earlier conquests. Judith was praised most high, and she warned the Israelites never to lose faith in God, and they in turn gifted her the lavish treasure of Holofernes' tent. Judith lived until she was 105, and no outside power threatened the Israelites again during her lifetime. As is evident from her story, the Book of Judith is a thrilling war tale in which the people of a small and impoverished kingdom overcome the might of a bloodthirsty empire. Judith is a heroine who shows incredible bravery and guile to entrap and then assassinate the war criminal who has massacred cities and towns for hundreds of miles. But the Book of Judith is not included in many versions of the Bible. It is not part of the Protestant canon, for instance, or the Quran, and the story was essentially forgotten by Judaism until the 15th and 16th centuries. Commenting on the book while assembling his own new version of the Bible, Reformation Protestant Martin Luther said, If the truth of the history of Judith could be established by satisfactory evidence, it would be a noble and beautiful book, which might well find a place in the Bible. As it is, there are errors and doubts both as to dates and names which I cannot in any way clear up. These errors would be notable immediately to anyone familiar with ancient Middle Eastern and Biblical history. For instance, the first line of the book states that Nebuchadnezzar was king of the Assyrians when he was in fact king of Babylon. As Dr. Douglas Metzger of the Literature and History podcast points out, this is a bit like a 21st century book stating that Napoleon was emperor of England. What? The Book of Judith also states that its story takes place soon after the Babylonian captivity. But it was King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon who destroyed Jerusalem and carried the Jewish people off as hostages, and he was long dead by the time they were freed, the Middle East by then having passed into the control of the Persians. The book also has its share of continuity errors, such as Judith bathing herself when the water to her town has been cut off for a month and people are dying of thirst. Judith's purpose, though, comes from the idea that it was most likely written and became popular at a period close to the last century BC, when the Jewish nation was under threat from the Seleucid Empire and then the Roman Republic, and it provided a rallying call to an earlier heroic time, as well as providing reassurance to the beleaguered people of Judea in the face of those enormous empires. 
Its association with cheese-based foods at Hanukkah seems to come from the resurgence in popularity the story enjoyed during the late medieval and early modern period, and this was due to the Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula, when the monarchies of Castile and Aragorn instituted a strict policy of conversion on its remaining Muslim and Jewish subjects. More than 1,500 years after its composition, the story of the remarkable woman Judith was still providing succor and empowerment to those who felt themselves defenseless, and its spirit lived on through the Renaissance, giving inspiration to artists and writers like Dante, Donatello, Michelangelo, Caravaggio, Botticelli, Titian, Goya, and Klimt, among many others. Even if not based on historical fact, it is truly one of the most intriguing tales ever told. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.